Hello, everyone. Welcome to the I'm Daniel Cho, an economics PhD student studying health behaviors and factors affecting smoking consumption at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Talks is organized by Mike Pasto at University of Missouri, C. Shang at the Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and James Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. And questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. And your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. Now I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pesto from University of Missouri, to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our winter spring 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Anton Badev entitled Tobacco Policy and Unstable Friendship, Friendship Networks. This presentation was selected via a competitive re review process by submission through the TOPS website. Anton Badev is an economist at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. His research explores how networks of interconnections, social or financial, generate spillovers, including peer effects. A distinct feature of this approach to modeling and estimating peer influence is endogenizing the socioeconomic network, for example, allowing agents to choose their peers. This perspective allows us to evaluate public policies that operate via engineering agents' socioeconomic environments, such as changing socioeconomic composition of a school or a classroom. He obtained a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Our discussant today is Michael Darden, an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Anton Bedev, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you um, to the TOPS organizers for setting up this wonderful new venue and for having me on the program. Thank you to all of you uh, dialing in virtually. This talk is uh, Tobacco Policy in a Stable Friendship Network and is a part of a broader analysis encompassing uh, methodological contributions in pure and applied theory. I will only hint to the theoretical analysis, leaving out the details to an auto-published paper. And I will talk about empirical analysis of peer effects and public policy in the case of adolescent smoking. Zooming out, this talk is about the decision to smoke and the decision with whom to hang out. The narrow goal is to argue that peer effects are as important and interesting to study as is the choice of peers a point completely overlooked by the peer effects literature. The broad goal is to argue that thinking about the choice of peers jointly with the choice to smoke or any other risky activities allows us to think about brand new types of public policies. This is the usual disclaimer and uh, disclosures, um, and specifically I have received no tobacco related funding over the past 10 years. And uh, these are my views and not necessarily the, those of my employer, the Federal Reserve Board. So given the audience, um, I think I should not argue explicitly about the importance or the how central should be uh, for public policy uh, preventing uh, smoking tobacco. Similarly, 
I shouldn't argue how um, central is ad adolescent smoking. But I think the, the, the turn I want to take is that peer influence is among the major determinants of adolescent decisions to smoke. Specifically, peer effects have implications for the design of efficient public policies, especially public policies that are likely to change the social norm. And here I want to preempt much of the analysis, just uh, provocatively ask, posing the question, what if the social fabric responds to the public policy? So what opportunities this may present and challenges to the um, analysis and policymaker? Now I will argue for a novel perspective on peer effects. In particular, while much has been said about how socioeconomic backgrounds shape human behaviors and friendship patterns, there is also an interplay between the human behaviors and social network that has not been fully explored. To make the point, I look at the adolescent tobacco smoking and friendship patterns in the data from the National Longitudinal um, Study of Adolescent Health, also known as the Ad Health Dataset. Looking at the first bullet point, indeed, smoking rates vary substantially by socioeconomic backgrounds. For example, blacks tend to smoke much less than whites in this data. On average, the likelihood of a black high school student smoking is three times less than of a white one smoking. And similarly, older students smoke much more than younger students. Turning to the second bullet point, High school students tend to segregate. In particular, blacks tend to be friends with blacks and older students tend to choose older students as friends. And the final bullet point, this is the mixing matrix between smokers and non-smokers from the Ad Health data set. The mixing matrix groups the friendship nominations with respect to the smoking status of the nominator and the nominee. So you can imagine that there are two sides of a friendship and they want to study how the friends are mixing with respect to their smoking status. For example, in the top left cell, we see that in 304 nominations, a smoker has nominated a smoker as a friend, while in 418 cases, a smoker has nominated a non-smoker as a friend. The point is that 42% of friends of smokers are smokers themselves, while there are only 21% of smokers in the sample. The conclusion I want to drive is that friendship selection and smoking behavior are interrelated. Well, the existing literature has acknowledged these regularities in the data. In particular, numerous papers in the last six years have asked how much a smoking friend influences your decision to smoke. So here, the, this talk is going to depart from this paradigm in an important way, recognizing that friends are choice. They cannot be assigned. Teammates can be assigned, room, roommates can be assigned, but not friends. And rather, we'll ask more generally, about the role in the intrinsic individual preferences versus conformity with the social environment in generating these differences in smoking rates. To say it in another way, to what extent blacks smoke less? Is it because they do not like smoking, these are the intrinsic individual preferences, or because they are surrounded by blacks who are not smokers themselves? Now, flipping this question around, I'm asking, to what extent blacks choose blacks as friends? Is it because blacks like blacks or because blacks uh, uh, make similar choices? And we tend to surround ourselves with individuals that conform our decisions. With this perspective on peer effects, this talk will ask a very policy-oriented question. What opportunities the friendship networks present to a policymaker with respect to fighting high smoking prevalences. It's easy to see generalizations where the policymaker targets socioeconomic be uh, behaviors in systems with spillovers. An alternative spin of this question where the sign of the intended effect is flipped has immediate relevance for marketing. What opportunities does the social network present to marketing leader who targets consumer behavior? The logically prior question to ask is whether the social network responds to policy directly targeting risky activities, and as such, whether this response dampens or magnifies the intended effect of policies such as tobacco prices. Before moving on, I want to pause for a moment 
and develop your intuition about the role of the friendship network and specifically the role of the decision environment through a comparison between two hypothetical prototypes of decision environments with fixed and endogenous friends. By endogenous, I mean decision environment where one is free to change her friends. If you think about the effect of changing tobacco prices, increasing tobacco prices, this effect is likely to uh, operate in two channels. First, there may be a direct effect of a price increase just because you change the decision environment. Individuals are likely to respond to this. There may be also an indirect effect or ripple effect where we don't, where individuals don't respond per se to the changing of the tobacco prices, but that they respond to the changes of the decisions of their friends. If their friends stop smoking, for example, they are, some of some individuals may are more likely to stop smoking themselves. Now, when we think about comparing these two decision environments, it turns out that the fixed friendship network underestimates the direct channel of the price increase. Why is that? Well, if I'm surrounded, if I'm locked in um, friendships with um, smokers, I may be less likely to respond directly to the price increase. Symmetrically, and exactly the opposite, fixed friendship network are likely to overstate the indirect effect of price increases. Why? If the policy manages to alter the smoking behavior of a single individual cluster in a tight cluster of friendship, then this individual is bound to exercise peer pressure on her friends and hence fix um, a mindset or a model, econometric model that takes the friendship network as fixed is likely to overstate this repo effect. And here I'm going to uh, take the time to overview um, our empirical results. Yes, endogenizing the friendship network or statistically treating the friendship network as um, adaptive magnifies the intended effect of price changes by extra two, three percentage points. In addition, medium-sized anti-smoking campaigns have a spillover factor of around two. This is a well-known uh, question about the spillover of policy, whether it's proportional to the policy or exceeds the policy uh, in case there is a, a bandwagon effect. So here I have a, a, I obtain a, a, an additional estimate of this uh, spillover factor, which is in line with the literature so on the upper side. Moving to the second question, B. I would like to go back to the more general question of whether the policy can, the policymaker can engineer the dimensions, dimensions of the social environment, such as school ratio and grade composition, to affect systematically the overall smoking rates. For example, consider two schools consisting of individuals with different racial backgrounds and hence different smoking behaviors. As I said. On average, a black high school student smoke, smoke three times less. They're three times less likely to smoke. Here, the question from a policy viewpoint is that if we mechanically combine these two racially segregated schools into a single school and allow individuals to interact, will this interact, will the students interact, will friendship be formed across different socioeconomic backgrounds? And if this happens, how the ultimate behavior of individuals will balance out? Would it be the case that those who are more likely to smoke influence their peers, their friends, to start smoking or the other way around? So this is purely empirical question of how mixing individuals with different prop propensity, individual propensity to smoke, how they're going to uh, influence each other. And finally, this is uh, the third question is purely um, positive. As I noted, one can uh, ask how decomposing the variation between smoking patterns is due to variation in preferences versus uh, different so socioeconomic, uh, uh, different social environments. That is to say, to what extent blacks smoke less? Is it because they are um, surrounded by non-smokers or is it because they really don't like smoking? And if you uh, uh, quickly look at the answers that we give, promoting racial diversity reduces smoking by up to 10%. So this is... Uh, um, this policy can be implemented in various different ways. But in the more positive question, 50% of the difference between white and black male smoking is due to social pressure. 
So this gives a uh, equal weight into the of the preferences and the social environment in generating these disparities in smoking behavior. One additional point, which is very intuitive, but yet um, I believe this research is the first to document it. The peer effect complementarities are substantially stronger between smokers compared to between non-smokers. That is, if you're in a cluster of smokers, you're much more likely to be um, exercise pressure on as opposed to if you are surrounded by unknown smokers. So I think here is a natural place to pause. Um, we have uh, completed the introduction of the, of the talk and uh, developed a research direction and uh, a set of answer in, in case um, there are questions. Thank you, Dr. Vinod, for a very interesting uh, presentation so far. Um, audience, please post your questions in the Q&A feature. Um, but first, we will take an opportunity for discussing comments from Michael Garden. Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah, so this is a, a great opportunity to um, discuss this terrific work, and, and I salute uh, Anton for, 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 um, for completing it. Um, you know, I, I think this is a really um, important work because it really shows how policy is um, how policy works. What are the mechanisms underneath, you know, which that policy is is effective? Um, and so, you know, the, I had not really thought about relation uh, peer relationships uh, other than you know the kind of standard kind of uh, driving initiation for smoking. And so, I, th I think this is just really really rich. Um, so, uh, I guess my first question is just uh, the general question is is how is it that you think about the interaction between friendship networks and and product characteristics in your context? So uh, when I think your results on on race are quite provocative, but it, it got me thinking about policy with respect to things like menthol cigarettes, for example. So one of the hot topics right now is whether or not we should the FDA should try to ban menthol cigarettes. And yes, blacks smoke much less than whites, but almost all of the menthol cigarettes in this country are consumed by African-Americans. So is there, is there something that your model can tell us about the potential effects of uh, a menthol ban um, in, in the relationship between like a specific product characteristic for which a group has a strong preference and, and these friendship networks? Yes, I uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I will, um, I'll compare the, this feature, the the flavor of the of the tobacco, to a, to an attribute of of the tobacco. So the same way, uh, the same way I think of of prices as a feature of the of the product. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way I'll, I can uh, I can think about uh, just being flavored tobacco. And I do believe that uh, this this um, uh, the, the framework is going to um, be able to be adapted without any. Um, fully to, to answer this question. For example, um, one question that one might ask is if if the response, for example, if the if the sensitivity, if the sensitivity of um, to uh, banning uh, flavored tobacco uh, is different across uh, sociodemographic groups, uh, this certainly they can be accommodated. But then uh, a natural question would be, would individuals that are more embedded into more uh, heterogeneous, um, racially uh, heterogeneous uh, friendships or not necessarily friendship, but social environments, they're gonna respond differently to individuals that are embedded in, in clusters of same race, same, um, you know, same socio-demographic uh, demographic, uh, characteristic uh, individuals. So this is something that uh, we can see how different high schools, for example, depending on their, uh, depending on their, uh, Sociodemographic profiles may respond differently mm -hmm. to this ban. In addition, take into account not only uh, the fact that um, there may be variation in the intrinsic preferences, but one additional factor that not only there is a variation in intrinsic preference between individuals, but also there is a variation in their social environments. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 um, yeah, I, I was I was wondering too if if we could get a kind of a direction of the effect, you know. So if we think about banning menthol cigarettes, um, would would that mean that uh, ignoring friendship networks would understate that effect, 
or or would it overstate that effect? I, I think you know in in your endogenous versus fixed um, uh, friendship uh, groups. Well, this is a very this is a very it's a very sharp question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me think for a second. Um, ignoring the friendship network will understate the effect of the policy, and this understatement will depend on the this understatement will depend on the uh, strength of the res the response. The more responsive are the more responsive are the individuals, the bigger is going to be the bias in a, in frameworks that would ignore the role of the friendship network. Okay. Okay. I think that that's what I, that was my prior intuition, but it's great to hear you confirm that. I mean, I, I think that's, I, I think it's really exciting because you can, you can use this, this, this is a very living framework that you've developed because it's very relevant to some of the questions that are going on right now. Um, uh, I guess one other question uh, before we go to the Q and A. I just I'm, I'm curious about how you think about the addictive nature of cigarettes in this in this context. So my 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 thought was that um, you know peer effects might might drive someone to become addicted, but then after becoming addicted, peer effects would be less important because of the 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 physical physiological response to 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 nicotine so um is that is that right or or how how do you think about addiction in this in this context yes yeah, so addiction is obviously very central to uh, to smoking uh this specific uh, framework i've developed in the mindset of uh, uh thinking uh, thinking in a static in a in a at one point in time so once we think about addiction it may have dynamic um, component uh where there's state dependence obviously and um, I'll have to think about adaptation of this framework mm -hmm. to handle the fact that that there is going to be data for more than one period. But at first, at first glance, um, I do believe this is doable because I've thought already in different contexts about introducing time in the, you know, in the in the framework. Great, um, Mike. Do you want to ask the questions from the Q and A? Yes. It sounds great. Thank you, Michael. Um, so two questions in the Q&A. Feel free to add any others that you have. Um, first question, uh, how do you, you reliably define friendship networks? Yeah, that's a very nice question. So the the I use this specific data set, uh, the Alt Health data, for the fact that it uh, contains data on the friendship nominations. And the way, so there are two answers to this question. First, the data comes um, in the following form, um, each high school student is asked to nominate five of her best female and five of her best um, male friends. So I know their friendship nominations uh, from the data. Now, the feature of this way to collect data and probably any other way to collect data on the friendship network is that the answers of individuals not necessarily uh, coincide. For example, it's possible that um, um, Alan will uh, nominate Bob as friend, but Bob may not nominate Alan as friend. So we need to take a stand about, about uh, reporting error. And the way I have moved this to the statistical model is that I have filtered only the friends for which the nomination has been mutual. That is Bob Alan has nominated Bob and Bob has nominated Alan as friend. So I keep only those friendship as I have done a, a, a extensive robustness exercise but those friends a friendship the one that there is a mutual nomination appears really to uh, to be to have more meaningful more meaningfully to capture influence between individuals okay uh second question uh kind of a common question uh, peer pressure can only provide a partial answer to the initiation of smoking in order for such pressure to exist there should be Many peers who apply such pressure and have already started to smoke before they applied the pressure. How did they start to smoke? Are we talking about some perpetuum mobile? I see. So the way I would think about um, the data is I th I'm thinking about the data at a given period in time. We fix, let's say, the spring semester of 2024. And this is the state for which 
I have the data at a given point in time. I do not consider how the smoking evolves over time. I do not consider what were the what were the sequence of smoking decisions by adolescents which led to this uh, outcome in the spring of 2024. Whether some of them started smoking in in the, in just the previous uh, semester or per previous year and so on and so forth. So I think that. Um, Tracking, uh, this is going to be linked to uh, um, Michael's question um, that tracking the the patterns of smoking over time, this would be a, this would be the next uh, logical exercise, one to think about, you know, how the smoking initiation works, how the smoking initiation penetrates to, to peers, for example. I can think about many different um, trajectories of smoking. Imagine a, 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 a tight cluster of high school friends and then imagine one of them starts smoking. So from here, we have at least two trajectories. So one trajectory is that he to, I'm gonna use, um, you know, this, this word, um, infect, uh, just figuratively. The, you know, one trajectory is he to infect the other uh, high school students and they start smoking. Or another trajectory is um, um, they to resist the fact that one of uh, their close friends smokes and uh, the third trajectory is not only to resist, but also to unfriend him and to stop associating with him. So uh, this is definitely a very a relevant uh, question I can imagine being of, of great positive uh, um, significance to see how the evolution of, of these tight clusters of friends uh, evolve, but this is beyond the scope of, the, of this talk. Okay, thank you. That clears the Q&A panel. Please continue with your presentation. Okay, in the next... Uh, two or three slides, I'm going to introduce just enough language to be able to know a few high level details about the technology that I'm using to carry this uh, the research. Uh, the, the, the point here is I have to be upfront. The point here is just to have enough language to, to, to introduce the challenges, the hoops, uh, and to hint to some of the solutions as opposed to, uh, to discuss uh, technical uh, details uh, in, deep, in, 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 in the greater, uh, in the longer time. So that keep that in mind whenever we go to the next few slides. Uh, we just want to list the, the methodological challenges, the data challenges, and the econometric challenges that uh, that are emerge in this uh, in this direction, research direction. So this is um, uh, this is an example of three individuals or three high school uh, adolescents, which um, two of them are denoted smokers. They are in. Uh, shaded stars uh, and their friends there is a link between them and uh one is a non-smoker so this is the only uh, point that i want to make with this uh diagram next i want to uh uh point out uh that if uh, we have uh, social individuals individuals who like to be surrounded by friends uh, there may be multiple outcome given a certain uh, tobacco price for example here we have two outcomes which are perfectly reasonable if we have individual one who likes to be uh, to be friends um, likes friendships likes uh, social interactions in the left outcome uh, individual one and three are friends and um, uh, they both are not smokers obviously because there are, there are synergies uh, or so-called peer effects uh, although I'm, I would say peer effects um, with a caveat and on the right, again, uh, these synergies between the, the decisions of friends are present in the fact that both one and two are smokers. The point I want to make is that these two outcomes um, are reasonable, intuitive, whenever we have peer effects. And it is uh, probably a priori not, um, um, not healthy to discard one of them um, a priori. And this is going to be one of the approach uh, one of the caveats that I, uh, I'm going to make when I uh, move on to study statistically this. So the first, uh, here I'm going to make a, a four a four remarks just uh, on in terms of methods and what are the challenges. I'm going to be deliberately brief uh, to be able to discuss um, the, the policy simulations at the greater length. Uh, the first is how we should model the decisions to smoke and decision to make friends. So I want to note that... Um, they have, these are fundamentally different decisions. Uh, one is a self-interested uh, decision. So I, I may decide to choose smoking based on my personal interest. And the second, uh, I may not uh, be able to befriend unilaterally uh, somebody. 
So traditional game theory rules out specific communication, cooperation, and coordination. And without going into further detail, uh, it is challenging to, uh, to nest these two um, these two decisions in a single uh, coherent um, framework, uh, mathematical framework. The second uh, challenge is uh, about the notion of equilibrium. It's related yet different, uh, different point. Here, uh, the equilibrium uh, outcome is important to be carefully defined because uh, the ultimate purpose is to talk about counterfactuals or what ifs. What if we do this? What if we do that? Which these are different, uh, maybe different uh, public policies. So we need to have um, a coherent uh, notion of, uh, of equilibrium outcome uh, after putting all these decisions into a single decision problem. The third, I already alluded to it, is that we need to take a, a delicate stance on the equilibrium selection. I do believe that whenever there are peer effects, uh, which captured by design externalities, they create scope for coordination. So among three friends, they can be happy being friends smoking. They also be happy in another, in alternative uh, um, world where they are friends and not and not and not smoke. So the notion of having different outcomes uh, is very natural. So the 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 departure from the uh, from from the a typical approach to think about this is to rank the equilibrium in probabilistic sense. So I want a, a statistical framework which does not pick a single, and does not rely on a single equilibrium. Rather, I want a statistical framework that ranks the equilibrium in a probabilistic sense. So I assign probability, and this probability, of course, depends on the, the parametric, um, the, on the concrete parameters. Uh, but the, the statistical framework I want to assign probability on each of these different uh, outcome. And finally, I I'm going to just uh, mention just uh, briefly, whenever we think about networks and graphs, uh, this is very interdisciplinary field. Uh, and uh, we have to have on the top of our mind that it is challenging to work with these data structures. They're, they're challenging to both in terms of estimation and computing, but also they're challenging uh, in terms of uh, simulating hypothetical equilibria even once we know the coefficients. So with this um, a technical digression, I'm gonna go back to a more intuitive um, um, discussion of, of, the, of the structure. So this is the payoff, and I want to discuss the payoff of individual payoffs only to the extent to motivate what channels of um, influence the, 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 the framework that I introduce uh, captures. So specifically, AI is the decision to smoke or not. I is an index for individual, and A is zero or one. It's a binary variable, and uh, which just takes zero and one. So VI, VI would be the intrinsic utility of smoking. So this utility may be function of individual characteristics, also function of the um, of the um, characteristics of the a specific tobacco product. For example, here uh, flavored tobacco or not uh, could be a characteristic that enters in this pro in, in this. Um, utility of smoking. This is uh, this enters here in a, a game theoretic framework, but this is going to be translated in a statistical framework just in the next slide. The point is that this is one place where the price is going to enter. This is one place where uh, whether the buck is flavored or not is going to enter. The next term is going to capture a specific uh, peer pressure. This peer pressure is from just visually observing our surrounding environment. So this is phi is a uh, coefficient of interest. It's a uh, aggregate externality, so aggregate peer effects independent from individuals that are peer, that are friends or not. This is just by observing. Uh, and it's going to sum across uh, the smoking. It's going to compute the average smoking uh, across the entire, let's say, class or the entire school that individual uh, attends. The next uh, two terms are going to be the last I'm going to comment, and then we're going to move on to the, uh, we're going to move on. So these are two terms which distinguish between the peer effects or the complementarities between smokers and complementarities between non-smokers. So phi S and phi N are coefficients that we want to estimate. And here they capture the additional utility or the additional uh, pleasure that the individuals have from hanging out together and doing the same thing. Uh, importantly, they could be a, they, are, they could be different in terms of magnitude. It could be the case that hanging among smokers gives you a, um, a larger uh, utility gives one larger utility provided, uh, provided they're all smoking as opposed to non-smoking. Uh, I'm going to skip the next three terms, which capture well uh, discussed uh, uh, motives for, uh, 
forming peer for uh, network formation in the literature of uh, uh, network formation. But uh, intuitively, uh, they capture just the motive for having friends, the motive for clustering, because in social networks, differently to financial networks, in social networks, one of the biggest differences is the fact that uh, friends tend to cluster. So you see this triangle of friends uh, because they meet in a certain way, because they may have similar preferences, but you see a lot of triangles in the friendship network. And finally, the last uh, term just capture convex costs or, or decreasing marginal utility of having additional friends just to make sure that uh, uh, the statistical framework does not simulate, does not capture situations in which uh, the um, network is fully, fully connected. Okay, moving on. Uh, I This is the last slide on the statistical model. And, the, and what I want to say with this is that uh, in terms of uh, uh, understanding, you can think about uh, this as a couple of simultaneous uh, regressions. So imagine uh, that um, you have having data on smoking and friendships and simultaneously estimate the propensity to smoke and the propensity to uh, for a link between uh, two individuals. These are the incremental utilities and they capture exactly these incremental uh, pressures on, let's say, smoking. As, he, v, as you see here, VI is the intrinsic preference for smoking. As I said, it may depend on observables. Phi, phi S, and phi N, these are the peer effect uh, parameters that are going to capture aggregate peer effects, uh, peer effects from uh, smokers and peer effects from non-smokers. So symmetrically, um, this is done for the incremental utility for um, making a friend. I don't want to say more about this. The only thing that um, it may be easier to think about is uh, just uh, a couple of simultaneous uh, equation model. It is not this exactly, but uh, the role that, um, but they, they, it bears similarity, similarity with this approach. So with this, I'm going to um, uh, maybe uh, just pause for 10 seconds in case there are questions about uh, the mechanics. And if not, we'll move on with uh, with the data and the estimates. Well, well, there's there's one Q and A question here, sure that I that might might fit. Um, uh, maybe both actually. So um, why don't we just get these out of the way? Uh, looking at the decision to smoke, uh, is it possible that smoking is a marker of being a member of a tight friendship group? Could a lower risk nicotine product, uh, non combustible, potentially serve that purpose? This assumes you are going to experiment with substances. Can you uh, repeat the question? Because I think there is a shade that I want to get. Sure, sure. Uh, looking at the decision to smoke, is it possible that smoking is a marker of being a member of a tight friendship group? Could a lower risk nicotine product, uh, non combustible, potentially serve that purpose? Yes. Very nice question. Yes. Um, what I'm presenting here, it's a very coarse decision to smoke. So in certain sense, uh, this is the minimalistic decision that interacts with the friendship network. As you can imagine, there could be much more nuanced decisions, not only to smoke, but how much to smoke and um, specifically whether to pick um, specific products, whether they are a flavored tobacco, whether they are a less um, um, harmful. This, uh, in terms of these discrete choices, this framework extends with 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 a minimum with a minimum effort to capture these more nuanced uh, more nuanced um, decisions, and then to to deliver uh, the framework. Then is going to deliver peer effects uh, uh, if you look at this uh, um, coefficients phi. So these coefficients phi are going to be differential between let's say peer effects uh, among uh, individuals to smoke. Peer effects to smoke flavored tobacco. Peer effects to smoke um, in a in a in a in a uh, something that is less um, harmful. So it is possible to differentially estimate in a richer model and richer marginally richer model um, this this peer peer pressures. And then I guess um, of a policy interest would be how strong are the peer effects to uh, to push individuals from smoking um, something that. Uh, it's really harmful uh, to 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 less harmful choices, but yes, this we, we can we can certainly this can be done. Yes, in a richer model. Yes, 
Okay. And one other question, uh, and then we'll move on. Uh, can the concept of friendship friendship network be expanded to community level social networks? Um, for example, smoking is more common in rural among rural residents compared to urban residents. Um, do you think that think your framework can be applied to inform response to tobacco control interventions at the community level? Yes, very nice question. So, if you um, if if you look at the at the uh, again, I I want to um, look at this. Two, think about this as two regressions. Okay, these are think about this as two regressions. Now, suppose that we uh, we want to apply uh, this technology to um, to data for which we don't uh, we have we don't have the structure the exact structure of the friendships, but we know community belonging to a certain community. Then um, what 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 can be done? Is that we don't we cannot estimate phi s and phi n. So these are the these are the pressure from your friends. But we can differentially um, uh, we can differentially um, estimate uh, phi for belonging to a certain community. So phi uh, phi then is going to capture belonging to a certain community, and then we we can ex, uh, we can estimate. Uh, how much belonging to a certain community, what's the effect of this controlling for everything else, including uh, uh, the price of tobacco, including the, um, the properties of the, of the smoking choice, uh, but on the top of everything, uh, estimate the effect of, of belonging to a certain community. So certainly this is applicable. It's, um, um, it's a special case of this, uh, of this uh, model. Okay, thank you. Please continue. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, um, app health data is special in that uh, it has uh, um, uh, information about individuals' um, uh, risky behavior, adolescents' risky behaviors, and uh, complete a complete friendship network. So this is critical, obviously, because uh, um, we need data on the friendship nominations. Uh, I believe that this is a well-studied data set, so I'm going to be very brief. It's a national representative sample of adolescents for grades 7 to 12. Uh, I use uh, data only from wave one, the in-home data uh, for 94, 95 um, year. And for 16 out of the 80 schools, all students are eligible for in-home interview. This is a second, this is another way of uh, collecting the data. So these 16 schools form what's called saturated sample and I need full sample uh, to carry the, uh, the estimation. Um, again, I, I'm brief, I'm brief here on purpose. Um, the one thing that I think is worth mentioning is the data, uh, the data is representative. Uh, but if you think about the unit of analysis for us is a school. So basically we want to have schools with different composition, let's say between blacks and whites. Uh, and, uh, actually the racially balanced schools is only one. And that's why we need, uh, uh with additional uh, technology to be able to extrapolate this, uh, variation into hypothetical scenarios where we have a uh, different uh, racial compositions and to predict how this racial composition is going to affect the overall uh, smoking. Um, so this is uh, these are the estimates. So the estimates in themselves are not very interesting. Uh, beyond, maybe I'm going to just mention one fact uh, here is that um, uh, if you look at uh, um, um, the last, the very last two, uh, the very last two um, uh, estimates of the, uh, the marginal propensity to smoke, having a single friend who is um, a smoker, uh, for a smoker is larger than for a non-smoker. So this, um, uh, the fees, uh, fee S and fee N that we discussed earlier, they're different. Um, they're different depending on the smoking status. So the peer pressures actually are different. Uh, beyond that, these um, uh, uh, we can we can uh, we can talk a little bit more about the, the bias when we don't have like for example data on the social network when the, we fix the network as opposed to um, having um, uh, exo endogenous network and if we shut down the peer effect channel we just estimate uh, uh, separately the two equations uh, without uh, having a, a, a link between them uh, but it's not a subject to such a rich interpretability that's why I want to move on. To, uh, to the uh, public policies, which I think are, are more interesting and um, certainly maybe more provocative. So the first thing that we want to um, uh, study is how the system is going to evolve of uh, if um, uh, once we estimate the model is if we increase the price. Uh, here, because we work with data from 94, 95, 
um, where the average price of uh, cigarettes is a uh, dollar point sixty seven, very different than now. Uh, twenty cents present uh, represent a ten percent increase. So twenty cents is a sub substantial increase in tobacco price. Uh, the baseline uh, in the sample in the final sample for estimation is a forty one um, uh, percent, and um, here the model uh, the model prediction uh, is listed in the second column and then we have a uh, model prediction when I, the model is estimated uh, when the network is fixed without allowing it to adapt and then there is no network data so these are the two uh, natural benchmark benchmarks what the point is here and i think i i prepared you for this is that um, when, when the full model uh, predicts additional effect of the price increase just because individuals are free to break away from their old friends, they respond more to um, they respond more to uh, to the public policy. The bias between if uh, if the friendship network is considered exogenous is not large, but um, it's meaningful. Uh, and um, a, a model or an approach where the friendship network is going to be taken as given is going to uh, bias the the estimated effect uh, of the public policy. Uh, when we don't have network data, when we ignore altogether the peer effects, the effects are uh, roughly half. So this peak, this is one way to measure the. This is one way to measure the um, the bandwagon effect of the uh, uh, social network uh, uh, magnifier, um, which which we're gonna revisit um, next. Okay, the next slide. Uh, I just want to show you. Uh, this is a little bit of a technical point, but I, I thought to mention in, in briefly that whenever we um, we use the proposed technology, we use a, maybe even a general quanta technology to simulate the effect of a policy. If we uh, neglect the uncertainty, uh, the uncertainty that is um, related to how the social network will respond, the predictions are different. So specifically, these are uh, uh, these are predictions of the uh, simulated predictions uh, of the effect on uh, uh, on overall smoking from um, um, changing the price of tobacco with 40, 80, and 120 cents. And the dotted lines are the predictions with exogenous network and the, uh, the uh, black line is uh, whenever the predictions are run with the, with the full model. Here the point is that the full model captures the uncertainty uh, related with the policy. That is to say that uh, uh, there is much more uncertainty uh, whenever individuals, we, when we take into account um, the effect of the the, the fact that individuals may may decide to respond to um, uh, to policy by to the policy by changing their friends. Uh, specifically, if you look at the uh, the case to the right, when we change the price with 120, and there is a small mass where it really the uh, the effect of the policy is above 20 percentage points. So. Uh, this is this is a manifestation of the fact that there are multiple equilibria. So the fact that there are multiple equilibria propagates into a further uncertainty about the result of the policy. The next uh, uh, policy that I consider is changing in the racial composition of schools. So this falls um, this falls into the category of how the policymaker indirectly can um, uh, engineer the social environment. So here we have, um, um, and the way this is done, it's it's in a very uh, challenging way because imagine uh, there is a, in the in the sample there is a single balanced racially balanced school. So what I do is I, I take um, the, the students from this racially balanced school and I use them as prototypes uh, in two in two schools that are um, uh, fully segregated, and then I uh, I conduct the experiment where I I start. Uh, uh, um, Moving, moving individuals from one school to the other by implementing, let's say, a policy of same race, uh, same race uh, uh, cap. Uh, so in the beginning, in the first row, the school white, I'm going to call it like that because uh, uh, it's composed only of uh, synthetic whites and then school blacks only of synthetic blacks. Uh, the overall smoking is 18.7. And as we uh, allow individuals to mix, as they, we, um, uh, we implement a policy where a certain, uh, a, a certain amount of... Um, students are from different uh, socio-demographic backgrounds, then you see how um, uh, smoking uh, smoking declines all, all together. So this is something uh, uh, very, um, this, this type of um, 
uh, this type of uh, uh, policy uh, with to, to, to simulate or to study this type of policy, uh, we have two approaches. So one approach is to seek for um, uh, for natural variation, which will be very difficult because we really need very, very large sample to study this uh, to this policy and to control for a lot of uh, other things. Uh, because the object of interest is the entire school. If you, you can think about uh, this as an observation being the entire school. So you need uh, to cover well the domain of all possible realization. We'll need enormous sample to have a statistical power. Or alternative, alternatively, uh, we can do this uh, with, uh, with um, putting a little bit more structure on the model. And the final, uh, the final um, policy simulation um, <clears throat> is uh, about an anti-smoking campaign. So what is an anti-smoking campaign? So think about a very problematic school. So I have uh, schools that they have more than 50% um, of uh, individuals smoking. So this is a very bad equilibrium. Uh, if you think about a, a, a given school with, with such a, such big smoking rate. So here I've picked one that is representative from the schools that uh, have relatively high smoking rates. And uh, uh, I simulate the, the 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 outcome of this um, uh, of this school uh, in the absence of uh, of any intervention. Uh, forty two percent of the high school students smoke tobacco. I'm this you know this is very undesirable uh, equilibrium. And then uh, um, and then I I imagine placing a program uh, where consecutively a small part of the school, let's say three percent or five percent of the school, are exposed to some a changing incentive. So this incentive could be varying in, in, in many, many uh, ways, but I have in, one thing that comes to my mind is, uh, let's say, very convincing uh, informational policy, some additional incentives of uh, targeting their, their families, their parents. Uh, the point is that the, it's very expensive to engage the entire school. It's very expensive to the, uh, engage the entire school and to treat the entire school. So we can treat only part of the school. At the same time, we pursue maximum effect given the uh, given the school. One thing that uh, uh, in terms of the thought exercise, uh, uh, of course, we want once we, let's say, influence 3% of the school, we want to see that the rest of the, their friends follow. But, you know, there are two, uh, two um, trajectories here. There are two options. So, for example, the friends of, uh, of these individuals that are treated, that, are, uh, that have changed their behaviors, may unfriend them. And then uh, if this is uh, the predominant outcome, then... Uh, will see uh, the effect of the policy being uh, constrained to the, those that are treated. And hence, it's an empirical question to see how the friendships are going to adapt to this new, new behavior, to the treatment of these individuals. A and B, um, uh, to the extent it adapts, how their friend's behavior is going to adapt. So basically studying peer effects, modulus, adaptive friendship network, and here, uh, the smoking is listed in the second column, the predicted effect when it's proportional to the smoking campaign, to the base of the smoking campaign, it's listed in the third column. The actual effect is the one that is delivered by the uh, proposed uh, technology. And then the multiplier is the ratio between the actual effect and predicted proportional effect, which is just the mechanical effect of the uh, treated stopped smoking. And you see that multiplier uh, is for small, uh, for small, um, uh, size interventions, it's it's close to two, which means that two that uh, if three percent are being um, um, you know stimulated to stop smoking, then uh, three more percent uh, stop smoking, uh, roughly. So with this, I'm ready to conclude in the last five minutes, and I thought maybe a good time to stop and see their questions. I'll just jump right in. I mean, thank you, Anton. The, the, Anton, that was really, really nice. Um, I have a couple, um, I have. I guess we don't have a lot of time, so I wanted to just kind of give you a, a big picture question, given that some people in the audience um, are, are actively engaged in primary data collection. Um, and so I, I guess this is just more of a, a question for you as a researcher. Um, what what kind of data do you do you really want to see what kind of data would be really helpful for you thinking about these kind of questions of of stable 
uh, friendship networks and and risky behaviors, particularly because you're using data from you know in this case you know 30 years ago, and it would be great to see some some data from from today. So so what variables or what kind of action would you love to see in data um, now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, thinking about the social network, uh, one restrictive um, uh, feature of, of, of the approach is that we need to know the social network. And this is, um, as, as most of the people can imagine, and certainly um, individuals who, um, who are thinking about collecting data, uh, this is very expensive. So going in a school and recovering the friendship network uh, presumes... Um, you know, at least a couple of things, exhaustive sampling, because uh, what if uh, the friendship nomination that I, uh, my friendship nominations, they point to somebody out of the sample. So immediately it becomes very expensive. Um, I think that as we move, so this, uh, this you know, the approach here that I, uh, that I have used uh, uh, relies on, on full sampling. It relies on the entire friendship network. And um, I think that still, but I, I know that still uh, econometric methods that think about uh, that are uh, uh, projective. Projective means um, what if I have a subsample and buy a, sub a subsample of the data that reports the friendship network and then if it points out of the sample, I just don't have the data. Projective methods are still not fully developed. We don't have reliable projective methods uh, that can work with uh, representative sampling. And it's still an open question if you if you study let's say thirty percent of the of the network, you know how you know how different are going to be these estimates uh, relative to um, to the full network. So I, I think that um, you know beyond the, the scope of this study, in generally, uh, the more we know about the social environment, the more we know about uh, adolescents' uh, social environment with whom they meet, uh, with whom they interact in in, in broad ways of. Um, you know, in broad strokes, whether it's they spend their time or whether they, they go to a club together, whether in, in a sports club. But the more we know about the social environment, the more we know about with whom they interact, the more precise answer we'll be able to uh, 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 to, to give to the questions that, that I have formulated here. So uh, my, you know, if I have to produce a, um, uh, a suggestion in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the data production, that of collection, collecting the data, uh, basically would be just having more about the individual social environments, what their friends do and what their friends are. And I believe that in the next, um, you know, in the next, I say, five to 10 years, more econometric and statistical methods are going to be developed to handle uh, subsampling if uh, full sampling is not, uh, is not an option. Great. I'm sorry, I cannot give a very. Oh no, no, yeah, no. It's 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 just that yeah. I, I think I think some people on this call might have have expertise in the primary data collection that you, you exactly what you need. So uh, I'll kick it back to Mike. I think we're almost out of time. Yes. Um. How about we try to do just one quick question? We just have one minute. Uh. Uh. In terms, um. And you can answer this question quickly, and then do the conclusion if you'd like, and then we'll be be done. But please turn for a uh, top of the tops if you'd like to continue the discussion. Um, uh, somebody's asking about how do we think about the impact of, of racial variability in Latin America and uh, Caribbean context in similar countries? What do you think about um, how they, you could apply your results and your model to their realities? So the, these questions, uh, these questions, these policies, they are, uh, of, they are they're universal. They wouldn't be tied to the U.S. reality. I do believe that uh, friendships are a primary driver for many, many activities, including risky activities across the world. I don't believe that um, uh, friends matter only in the U.S. And... Um, now here, the, in terms of practically uh, driving the, the, the points or, or performing the analysis, I think that the major uh, challenge would be, uh, the major challenge would be just uh, having uh, data. And this is related to, uh, to Michael's, uh, Michael Darden's uh, question. The main challenge is just to have a good quality data, good quality uh, data about, um, ab about individuals, you know, what is their social environment and, uh, and, and, uh, 
how you know what is the behavior of their friends that would be the major issue but i think that this is you know this this questions and the technology is universal and i do know that some of the uh, countries in south america they have a very good uh, administrative level data that one can can work with okay just to uh, I, i don't want really to uh, to keep you beyond the hour uh, just to conclude and i'm going to be very very brief um The main premise here, the starting point, is that in the, uh, that adolescents choose to smoke, but also choose with whom to hang out. And uh, friendships are not really a chance, but they are a choice. So we need to take into account the possibility that uh, uh, they respond to public policies. Not only to take into account uh, to think about this is a nuisance, or this is something that we need to um, you need to account in our estimation, but we take this into account opportunistically. By opportunistically, I mean uh, to think about public policies that can. Um, take advantage of this response into uh, into indirectly targeting um, 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 unfavorable uh, equilibrium outcome with very high smoking prevalences. In terms of uh, findings, uh, the, the, the few findings that uh, uh, that come out from this analysis is that uh, social networks respond to policies, school res racial composition matters. Peer pressures uh, generates almost half of the differential between uh, blacks and whites in terms of male smoking prevalences. So, and this half of the differential is due to peer pressure. Half is due to almost half is due to uh, uh, preferences. And um, there is substantial. Uh, this is something that has been already uh, um, identified in the literature, but there is a substantial spillover. Even in the context of uh, of having models where uh, friendships are um, adaptive, uh, can we leverage this research in designing efficient public policies? Definitely, in my view, uh, social networks may facilitate public policies, um, and uh, we have uh, a brand new tools for policy. Uh, those that target uh, the social fabric. So instead of targeting risky behavior, we can target the social fabric. We can target uh, with whom our uh, children interact. Indirectly, and then uh, and then see the the outcome uh, of these uh, new interactions. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Bidda, for a very interesting presentation. I'm now going to turn it over to the MC to take us out the door. It is your time. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Badev, you can join us for top of the tops. An interactive group discussion offered immediately following select COPS event this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We'll leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is bit.ly slash TOPS meeting with all lowercase. And thank you for to our presenter, moderator, and this person. Finally, thank you to the audience of 170 people for your participation. Have a tough notch weekend. <laughs>